of guests. Therefore, it's now time for member statements. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, this week marks National Palliative Care Week with the theme of Hospice Palliative Care First. This is an annual awareness week organized by the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. The purpose of this week is to bring awareness and education about end-of-life care in Ontario. There are still many myths that surround palliative care in Ontario, and this year's campaign is dis to dispel many of those myths. Palliative care is really about focusing on improving the quality of life for an individual and taking a holistic approach to focus on pain and symptom management. In my riding, Elgin Hospice Palliative Care Collaborative and other organizations have been working over the last few years to not only bring awareness to palliative care in Elgin County and St. Thomas, but also to create a residential hospice in the area. The need for a residential hospice does not, does not exist, and it is my hope that the government is listening to the local concerns from my riding. In 2014, the Ontario's Auditor General highlighted the dismal, dismal state of palliative care services in Ontario, which has resulted in inequitable access of palliative care, inefficient use of fundings, and a patchwork of varying services and standards across the province. Health Quality Ontario has estimated that only about 30 per cent of patients get the palliative care they should. This need will only grow as the population ages. Research shows that access to palliative care approach is better care not only for patients but for the family. It reduces that stress on the patient's family, improves quality of life and patient satisfaction, and places less of a burden on caregivers. I want to thank each and every health care professional that works within palliative care. Your work is not easy, and I commend you for what you do to your dedication to our health care system. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements? Uh, the member from Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. As you know, we'll soon be celebrating Nursing Week in Ontario. Down in Windsor and Essex County, the RNA has already recognized the efforts of one exceptional nurse. Mary Lynn Hosel is this year's recipient of the Lois Fairley Nurse of the Year Community Service Award. This award, named after the late nurse, mentor, and advocate, honors someone who has demonstrated a commitment to serving the community through excellence in patient care. Ms. Holsell has been nursing for more than 30 years. She's done it all from medical, surgical, pediatrics, telemetry, and ambulatory care. Years ago, Speaker, Mary Lynn lost a daughter, Holly, to sudden, death, uh, sudden infant death syndrome. There were no SIDS bereavement groups in our region at that time, so she went to the States, got the training, came home, and started a SIDS chapter to assist other parents get through the grieving process. She's been a volunteer manager and trainer for several hockey teams, a coach and team manager for the Amherstburg Soccer Association, and she's busy these days with the Miracle League, helping those with physical and intellectual challenges enjoy their time in the baseball field. Mary Lynn Hosel is described as kind, fun, hardworking, dedicated, and a compassionate nurse. She loves her job and the people she works with. Her greatest joy speaker comes from her patients. You'll find her at the Willette campus of our Windsor Regional Hospital. The annual award allows Windsor area nurses to recognize someone who goes above and beyond and also to honor the legacy of Lois Fairley, who had an immeasurable impact on so many lives in our region. So, Speaker from the Ontario Legislature, congratulations to Mary Lynn Hosel, our Nurse of the Year in Windsor and Essex County. Thank you. For the member famous, the member from Newmarket, Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. On uh, April the 28th, I was honoured to attend the National Day of Mourning Ceremony in my riding of Newmarket Aurora, organised by uh, QP905. Members of the community gathered to show their respect and remember all those who have died or have been injured simply because they went off to work. QP905 has created a beautiful memorial rock garden with cascading water at its headquarters in Newmarket. It's such a moving location, Mr. Speaker, that members of the community stop by to add small rocks to the garden with the names of their loved ones who have died in workplace accidents written on them. Mr. Speaker, I doubt there's anyone here in this house who hasn't been touched in some way by a workplace death or injury. My father worked in manufacturing, and I heard too many horror stories about friends and colleagues who had died or been injured at work. The National Day of Mourning is not only a day to remember and honour those lives lost or workers injured due to a workplace tragedy, but also a day to renew the commitment to improve health and safety in the workplace 
and prevent further injuries, illnesses and deaths. I offer my sympathies to all those who have lost a loved one in a workplace accident and to those who suffer ongoing injury or illness as a result of poor work environments, and I offer a heartfelt thank you to QP905 for hosting this moving event. Thank you. Thank you. Member Sims, the member from thank you, Speaker. Organized insurance fraud is a serious problem that impacts the cost of insurance for all consumers. It's estimated to cost upwards of $1 billion in Ontario alone. A recent undercover investigation, widely televised, revealed staff at professional clinics encouraging and counselling undercover investigators to commit fraud. It's shocking to see how some professionals who should be protecting accident victims are instead encouraging the undercover investigators to lie so they can submit phony forms and collect insurance payments for services never rendered. A recent Insurance Association survey found that 69 per cent of respondents believe there is fraud in the Ontario auto system. This systemic fraud is being carried out by those who skirt the law and result in higher premiums for consumers. It is unfair to honest, law-abiding Ontarians who play by the rules. It hits all of us in the pocketbooks, Speaker, and as much as 10 to 15 per cent of injury payouts are fraudulent. I urge the government to take real action to truly attack the root cause of this issue. On the organized auto insurance fraud front, reforms are needed to deliver benefits to injured claimants and not only service providers. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Member Simmons, the member from America, uh, Roma, Manitoba. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today on a little bit of a sad note. Um, you know, in my constituency office, I have Grant Buck, Vicky Arsenault, and Cindy Haddo who are there. But uh, today I rise to uh, recognize a really big part of my uh, my puzzle, and that's Claire Prashaw. She's my executive assistant that I have here, and she, this is her last week that she's going to be spending with me at Queen's Park. She's moving on. She's an amazing woman. She's a single mom raising a beautiful boy. His name is Cruz. I've often played with Cruz in my office, thrown popcorns, played a couple of puzzle games, and he really likes my exploding washroom that I have in my, uh, my office. But I, uh, I have grown to not only respect Claire, but really love Claire. Uh, when I first got here, I was a little rough around the edges. Claire molded me into what I am here today. She actually was on me for the last four and a half years to actually get into the gym. I've been at the gym now, Mr. Speaker, for the last eight weeks, and it's thanks to Claire, but she's moving on. So her project with me is done. Um, I really, um, when I sat down and we had a chat with Claire, there were many people that came up to me and they said, you know, why are you choosing Claire? And my simple response was them, to them was, if she's good enough for Jack Layton, she's damn well good enough for Mike Mantha. Claire, I'm going to miss you. I know you're sitting at your desk. I love you to death. You are my best friend that I've had here for a very long time. Good luck with your endeavors, and you're always welcome at Suite 160 to come for a hug. Thank you. You told me I was your best friend. <laughs> Member Stevens, the member from York Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in the House today to remember the over 1,000 fallen Italian workers who have lost their lives building our province. Last April 28th, on the National Day of Mourning for workers who have been killed or injured as a result of work, over 500 people, including myself and several members of this legislature, gathered at Toronto's Villa Colombo Memorial Gardens to pay tribute to the victims of workplace accidents. There is now a permanent Italian fallen workers memorial at this site consisting of 11 metal columns engraved with the almost 1,000 names of the victims, which will forever remind us of these lives that were taken too soon. The Italian Fallen Workers Memorial is the culmination of a six-year effort to formally recognize the enormous sacrifices of Italian workers in Ontario's construction and industrial development for more than a century. Many of them came here, Mr. Speaker, to Sault Ste. Marie, to Toronto, to Welland, to work in the mines, the hydro projects, the canals, the railways, the roads, bridges, subways, and skyscrapers. Through the committed work of volunteer researchers, led by the project leader, Mr. Marino Topan, 
The committee continues to uncover the names of victims of workplace fatalities of Italian origin. I wish to thank Mr. Marino Topan for his tenacity, the entire committee, the volunteers and the donors for making sure that future generations know about the price paid by their fathers and grandfathers in building our beautiful province. Thank you. Thank you for the member statements. The member from Lanark, from that, <laughs> Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington. Good. Very good, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'm glad the Minister of Children and Youth Services is here as well. Uh, Speaker, I was both astonished and disturbed when I was informed that the partnership between my local school board and the Cordic Treatment Program was arbitrarily terminated. The, Cor the Cordic Treatment Program helps at-risk youth gain foundational skills that they need to return and thrive in the classroom, and has helped over 600 students and is a model of success. The Cordic program is a private company which receives its funding via student referrals to their program. However, it was revealed this week during Children's Mental Health Week that the funding for this successful treatment program has ended and the funds will instead be spent by another mental health agency to cover its operating deficit. They are balancing the agency's budgets on the backs of at-risk children. This is atrocious and shameful and happening in Ontario. But what is also disturbing, Speaker, is that the director of the Upper Canada District School Board, Mr. Swila, and the mental health agencies refused to meet with either myself or the Cordic, direct, Cordic Program Director to find a solution. Speaker, I'll continue to fight to keep this treatment and therapy available for the children in my riding so that they receive the help they both need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Further members' uh, statements? The member from Halton. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week I had the pleasure of welcoming Premier Wynne to my riding of Halton, and it was a wonderful visit that gave local residents a chance to speak directly with the Premier. For me, the highlight of the visit was sitting down for a roundtable discussion with our local Downtown Business Improvement Association. Members of the DBIA were able to discuss issues of importance to our community, including transportation, business challenges, and ways to grow the local economy. It was a fantastic conversation and gave everyone there a glimpse of the thriving arts and business communities in our growing town and the dedicated people driving our local economy. It was a great way to share ideas, and it really helped to show the DBA, DBIA that our government, all the way up to the Premier, is listening. Thanks to the 16-mile photography gallery in downtown Milton for allowing us to use their beautiful space. The gallery's amazing photo exhibit was shot entirely on fo mobile phones, and it was amazing to see what can be done with a little talent and cell phones. Mr. Speaker, the meeting was positive, and members of the Milton business community were very happy with the discussion. Thank you to the Premier for engaging our Cope community, and thank you to the Milton DBIA for their valuable contributions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the member statements. The member from Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This month marks the 14th annual celebration of the Asian Heritage Month, and I rise today to honour and recognize Asian Canadians who have enriched our province, our country, with achievements, contribution, and vibrant cultures. Notable Asian Ontarians who have made valuable contributions include Dr. Tak Mak, whose significant work in microbiology and immunology has influenced public health worldwide, Jean Lam, the first Chinese-Canadian woman and the first restaurateur to receive the Order of Canada for her community work, Raymond Moriyama, international renowned architect whose designs are recognized locally and internationally, Tanya Kim, co-host of CTV eTalk, Charles Chi, an entrepreneur and current chancellor of Carleton University, Wei Chen Yi, president of the Confederation of Toronto Chinese Canadian Organization, Scarborough Asian Court resident Jonathan Lai, a star badminton athlete and Quest for Gold recipient, and Wei Sun Choi, an award-winning author. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, throughout the month of May, Ontarians will have an opportunity to participate in various Asian Heritage Month festivities. This annual celebration preserves the rich Asian culture and heritage, as well as promotes a better understanding between the different cultural groups. At the same time, Recognize the Canadian, uh, Asian Canadians, supports Canadian values, mutual understanding, respect of diversity and multiculturalism. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of my Asian heritage and to have a privilege to serve my beautiful riding of Scarborough Asian Court as MPP and to be the first Asian woman to be appointed Deputy Speaker. Thank wow. you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you.
I thank all members for their statements. It's now.